I'm on this bus at 17. I'm about a mile from my home, and I notice that the bus driver is not moving. The doors are closed, and I see at least 50 young white men in red bandanas charging toward the bus. It's myself, another teenager, and the bus driver who are the only black people on the bus. And what year was this? This, ooh, so I was 17. Ooh, good. I'm sorry. <laughs> My knowledge and experience with people of color is we talk about racism all the time. Every day, probably. Now that's because it's our life, right? Our life depends on it. But white people really don't have that conversation regularly, if at all. So some people can say that white people, no matter what you tell them, no matter what kind of conversations you have, they'll never understand it. What do you have to say about that? I agree, but they can really learn about it and understand that while they can't ever understand, they can remove a lot of the layers that keep them from seeing and listening and believing us mm -hmm. when we tell you. Everybody, welcome to another show of the Release of Change podcast where we have real, raw, and revolutionary discussions helping people just like you release your mental, emotional, financial, and generational chains. I am so excited to have Miss Lynn Maureen Hurdle with me today. We're going to be talking about some really good stuff. So go ahead, relax, do whatever you got to do, and get ready. <laughs> so Lynn is a conflict resolution strategist and communication expert who created the Soul of Conflict Summit, a groundbreaking online forum designed to create deep dialogue around conflict, old wounds, and healing, which is something we always talk about here. <laughs> because she knows that leaders who, and everybody really, right? Yes. Leaders, um, everyone who are, who, are, who are willingly and skillfully um, engaged in conflict will be our most successful leaders. She also leads a sold-out group on the matter of race. I love this. A six month journey for white people who want to learn about racism and take action. So thank you so much. I think this is such a, a great topic about conflict resolution. So, <laughs> well, so, I'm so glad that you want to talk about it because most people do not. Yeah. Why do you think people don't? Oh, because it has a real negative rap in our world, right? No one is raised to say, I cannot wait to get into my next conflict. Everyone's <laughs> like, please, That's do true. not mess with me today. That's true. So, so we always look at it and media presents it as something that it, that we shouldn't look forward to. But conflict's an opportunity for growth mm -hmm. beyond a whole lot of different ways that we could even imagine. So what got you? Tell me your story. Like, what got you here? <laughs> it's so... Uh, I mean... I was not planning to be here. So mm -hmm. I, from the time I was three years old, I was in theater and singing and dancing and yeah. writing. And so I knew I wanted to be an entertainer. I'm not just an entertainer. I want to be a star. I'm a Leo. I want to be a star. <laughs> <laughs> And so I was headed to be a theater major at Syracuse University. Uh, I was 17 years old. I was already uh, getting ready to graduate from the High School of Music and Art in, um, in New York. Mm -hmm. And I was on a bus on the way home. Now, at, at 17, I had lived in the neighborhood that I was living in for 10 years. My parents moved us out of the South Bronx because they wanted better schools. So we were in a predominantly white neighborhood. So for 10 years, we were there. I'm on this bus at 17. I'm about a mile from my home. And I noticed that the bus driver is not moving. The doors are closed. I stand up to look. It's a pretty crowded bus. And I see at least 50 young white men in red bandanas charging toward the bus. And I'm seeing they have baseball bats. I look around, because I already know, and it's myself, another teenager, and the bus driver, who are the only black people on the bus. Everybody else is white. Now, and was this a school bus or it was a public a bus? public bus. Okay. So and what I'm year in. was this? This, ooh, so I was 17. Ooh, good. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> around what year? Around what time? 
I did? Well, yeah, because I graduated in 76. So it was probably 75. Okay. Something okay. like that. Right. Okay. okay. And so, uh, so I'm like, uh oh, uh, we're in trouble here. And they surround the bus and they're like, get off the bus that using the n-word and the bus driver wouldn't open the door so then they start to try to turn the bus over oh. and the only thing that saved me was that on the other side of the street another bus rolled up and it was filled with african-americans okay. and so they ran to that bus and the young man and I, the other teenager, we jumped off the bus. He's terrified. He said, it's my first week Mm. I don't in the neighborhood. I don't even know how to get home. So mm. I took him home mm. and on my way home, mm. I distinctly heard a voice that said, I don't know how, but I think my purpose is to bring people together around this issue. Mm. And I was just like, as a teenager, as a teenager. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I'm supposed to be a star. <laughs> like, what is this? Yeah. And I went to Syracuse, and in my uh, sophomore year, mm -hmm. they opened up a new program called Nonviolent Conflict and Change. Mm -hmm. And I decided, well, if I'm supposed to be a star, I probably don't need a degree, so mm -hmm. let me get a degree in something else. Mm -hmm. And I switched majors, and I've been doing the work of conflict resolution ever since. Wow, so is you're doing it as a profession uh, and also in your own company as well? Uh, so I was doing it as a profession, working for other people, and then I decided once um, my once my husband and I decided that we were going to start a family, I really didn't want to work for anybody else. So I said, I'm just going to go out on my own. Mm -hmm. I had already been uh, doing, like taking my vacation days and doing consultant work, mm -hmm. so I was building a practice anyway. Mm -hmm. So I just decided okay so now I don't want to be nine to five with my kids around and I'm going to start doing the work for myself that's awesome so what has been you or what have you learned or I know there's been a lot yeah, I'm sure yeah, right yeah. but what have you learned that you think could be a teachable lesson for our audience about conflict? Conflict. Or, yeah, yeah oh, conflict. Okay. So, like, well, I'm an entrepreneur too, so I wasn't yeah, sure yeah, which sorry. way we're going. Yeah, I'm but sorry. Yes. Yeah, around conflict uh, so resolution. Yeah. yeah, so what I've learned is number one, if you aren't good at engaging in a conversation around conflict, then there's a lot of things that are, are not going to go well in your life. Mm -hmm. And because communication is everything, right? Relationships are everything. Mm -hmm. And particularly as an entrepreneur, you have to be able to communicate well with folks. And the minute you have conflict, if you are running from it, if you are charging at people, then what you're doing is creating more problems. You're probably uh, lessening your relationships, cutting off folks, and you really aren't being the best that you can be in those relationships. So what do you think is costing? Like think about mm -hmm. leaders and yeah. managers in the workplace or entrepreneurs, like what is it costing us by not having the tools and to share with us some tools to mm -hmm. help, you know, uh, the conflict resolution, yeah. especially around race. Yeah. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, that's huge. So what I do is I help people have the every day all the way to the really most difficult conversations, right? And I bring conflict closer to people so they can really start to understand it better than having to fear it. And it costs you a lot. Your mental health, mm -hmm. your emotional health, mm -hmm. dollars, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody really wants to do well in that. It costs you in your relationships, right? Mm -hmm. People. Yeah. It's all about having that connection mm -hmm. and being able to help people see your vision, to help people see you, mm -hmm. and then to be able to see them as well and help them with their vision. That's good. That kind of goes to that whole thing of showing people grace, but when you're upset or something doesn't go right or somebody pisses you off right that's right it's kind of like well what do i do how do i you know so what is that first step okay so the first step <laughs> nobody ever likes the first step i know i'm sure i'm scared already i'm scared <laughs> but the first step is to recognize that you may think it's them mm -hmm. but it's probably you mm -hmm. yeah i probably say 100 percent of the time it's probably you <laughs> Probably you. So you want to listen more than you talk. Mm. And, and then you want to listen to understand. 
understand. Most of us listen only up until the point at which we wish to interrupt, right? And then we're straight off, cutting them off and making our point. But it's really about if you're engaged in a conversation, right? And particularly where there's conflict, you really want to know what it is that you need to address. So you can't do that if you are cutting people off. You have to allow them to talk. And even to the point of where you really want to say something, I encourage you to ask them a question so that you can listen some more. That's good. So now, you know, when it comes to race, because you talked about that story, which is horrific, I think it could be traumatizing, you know, because we've all been through some kind of discrimination, some kind of way, people of color, right? So why do you think it's so important for white people to understand how to ask the right questions. Yeah, uh, because first of all, my knowledge and experience with people of color is we talk about racism all the time. Every day, probably. Well, that's because it's our life, right? Our life depends on it. But white people really don't have that conversation regularly, if at all. And so I know that there are white people who really want to do something about racism. But how do you do that if you honestly don't understand it, how it operates, right? right? That it's systemic and you don't know how to engage in conversation that's helpful to people of color, right? Rather than centering yourself, right? You need to be able to hear what it is that we need from you Mm -hmm. and then be able to participate. So I think that it's important that white people have the opportunity to be together with other white people, Mm -hmm. learning about racism and having the conversation. So you're not just in on the matter of race. We don't just fill you with information. Mm -hmm. We give you the opportunity to actually look at how it's internalized. Mm -hmm. It's internalized in all of us, Mm -hmm. but in white people, because they don't experience it, right? They don't have the kinds of Oh, uh, it's really my life, or yeah. my kid's life r- around it. They often don't see it. Uh, they uh, they deny it. And so to be able to be together with other white people and then myself and now my youngest son, who's 21, he's oh, coming cool. to oh, co-facilitate with me. Oh, and, good. A, and black a black, a black man. man. And many of them, is their first opportunity to actually be in conversation and relationship with a young black man. Mm. Many of them, because they grew up in all white neighborhoods, or even when they don't, they don't have friends of color or a lot of friends of color, and they don't have the kind of relationship where you have that conversation. Yeah, especially open, and yeah. So one per one, somebody could say, "Well, just like." we're women and a man could never understand what it's like to carry a child like mm. that 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 feeling that we have of nurturing and of womanhood and right. having a womb and giving birth so some people can say that white people no matter what you tell them no matter what kind of conversations you have they'll never understand it what do you have to say about that i agree but mm. they can really learn about it and understand that while they can't ever understand they can remove a lot of the layers that keep them from seeing and listening and believing us mm-hmm. when we tell you. Oh, that part. <laughs> right? That is so good because I do I do feel that they don't believe it because, you know, because they haven't experienced yes, it. Right. You get what I'm saying? So that's good. Mm-hmm. And believing what we're saying yes. and how we're feeling yes. and having that sympathy. This is awesome, you guys. Okay, you guys, we'll be right back with more with Lynn. No more chains holding me. She's a CEO is the ultimate family card game and also an educational business toolkit for seasoned and aspiring entrepreneurs. It's fun. It's challenging. It's educational. Get some knowledge and pay some homage. There are a few ways to play for the most enjoyment and benefit. Play your favorite card games, spades, gin, poker, bidwist, or whatever your family loves to play. Are you ready to be mentally challenged in a fun way? Play our signature BizWiz business development matchup card game. The objective is to collect the most customers correctly based on matched business development statements we've created for you. Each week, research one of the noted entrepreneurs we've celebrated in the deck by pulling one or two random cards from the deck. Use the cards for daily, weekly, or occasional inspiration. Read their stories and learn more about the chains they've had to release to create long-term success and a legacy that will last forever. 
She's a CEO, a SHEEO. Visit she's a SHEEO.biz to order your official business educational card deck today. No more chains holding me. All right, you guys, welcome back. So I have, we're talking about conflict resolution and communicating. So you have, you are a mother of two black men. Yes. Um, hmm, what's my question? I, I had a question, but I want to kind of shift it a little bit because I don't want it to be something so general. What have they told you about their experiences of being a black man yeah. in America? Yeah, it's interesting because uh, they both went to predominantly white schools, private schools growing up uh, and had very different experiences. So my youngest name, he really felt very different and he he has said uh, that there have been times when he's been out with his friends and it may be a mixed group, but he's really mostly the one, the only black person in the group uh, and he can feel the eyes on him. He, we live in New York, he said, you know, he's seen police officers who've just really looked him up and down and uh, looked at him suspiciously. Uh, he got he he got his license last year and he got stopped mm. a few months ago. And it and I was so grateful that he knew to call me. He just said, Mom, stay on the phone. I tell my son the same thing. Oh, my thing. gosh. And it was really, um, it was quite scary. So he said... It's difficult. It's hard. He he was one of the speakers. We just had a summit on racism, and he was one of the speakers, and he just talked about, you know, being a young black man is a lot of pressure on you to uh, to be your best, right? To not make mistakes, or uh, if you do make mistakes, you really have to watch yourself. It can't be the same kind of mistakes that young white males can make, because they're, they're just seen differently. My oldest son tends to try to just not really talk about it, but it, you can see the pain. When George Floyd was murdered, yeah. he called me and he just said, Mom, what can we do? And I was so hurt, but I was so grateful that I could say, well, People are doing some things, and I'm do here's what I'm doing. You know I'm doing on the matter of race. And he even went and uh, got some friends and told them about it, and one of his friends enrolled in it. And he just really was devastated at you know where we are yeah. and what that means. Yeah, right? after all this time, you yes. know. But I'm glad there's people like you that are a part of the change that you want to see in the world. So tell us about the summits. Is it virtual? Is uh, it live well, events? We just had our very first one on. The Matter of Race sponsored it as a virtual summit and it was live so we had over 20 speakers who were talking about racism and I really wanted people from all different backgrounds so we had uh, Indigenous Hawaiian, Indigenous Native American um, Chinese American, Puerto Rican I mean yeah. we just had I wanted people to understand you know uh, in America a lot of times people say well, whenever you have the conversation about race Race, it's a black and white, right? And hey, it's gonna be black and white because that the history is, is just we haven't settled that. That's true. We haven't settled it, but it is more than that. Yeah. And I wanted people to know, especially the white people who are attending, how far systemic racism reaches and and the and what it has done. Yeah to affect people's lives in a really bad way. Mm -hmm. So that we just had in July, and we are opening up our classes, our level one class of On the Matter of Race for September. It's a six month journey. Okay. And we're so are looking- they like, I'm sorry to cut you off. Mm -hmm. Are they like individual classes? So like, could I sign up or could I have you? So, so like, it's only for white people. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's only okay. for white people, but I, but I encourage people of color, look, come on, y'all know some folks that you would say, mm -hmm. you know what? Yeah. <laughs> And you could, really, especially some co workers, yes, probably. Yes, you could benefit <laughs> from this. Yeah. And so we start in September, it's uh, twice a month. Uh, 90 minute classes each for that whole six months. And it is phenomenal. There were, we had uh, 
18 speakers from On the Matter of Race mm -hmm. at the summit who mm -hmm. talked about what effect it's had on their lives. And we go level one through level five. So Now, what's level five? So, so tell me, like, <laughs> what am I, what's my takeaway? Like, what's uh, your level event five? Promise? Level five is really about, okay, so where do I want to focus? Because racism is big. You can't just yeah. tackle this mountain. Yeah. It's like, what's your interest? Because there, it is in every system, right, that we have to deal with in order to live. So is your interest in criminal justice? Is your interest in banking? Uh, one of my uh, close girlfriends, she is uh, featured in a documentary called Aftershock, which is about the uh, about black uh, mortality and during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. uh, she lost her daughter two years ago, uh, two weeks after pregnancy, to something that they should have really spotted. They should okay. have known okay. uh, because she had been complaining about it. Mm, now, that's a whole other topic mm -hmm. about this is why I am not trusting of the medical industry because they treat us not the same. That's correct. And that's correct. They're even teaching still in some medical schools that we have a higher tolerance of pain. Really? Yeah, that's correct. And so they don't give us the pain medication that will really change right? The pain that will affect the pain and lessen yeah. it for us. Yeah. I was a victim of that myself with my dentist. Yeah. Wow. So black people, y'all, <laughs> maybe it's because we go through all the stuff that we have to go through. I mean, we are strong people, but yeah, that doesn't but mean. No, no. We have to really be able to understand that people are people and and it isn't about a whole group of people are subject to being able to take so much pain but we've been experimented on uh, yeah medically that's why so many people were afraid of the COVID time. vaccine that's like right. y'all go ahead and be the that's test dummies that's right mm -hmm. that's right and so uh so in level five you're learning and you're saying okay so this is we've learned so much and this is really where a real estate or a finance bank all of the different areas unfortunately like I said, it's in everything. So you're looking at where do I want to make a difference, right? And and make my mark. And one of the things that I'm so proud of is that the folks who are in level five started with me in level one three years ago. And so they've they've leveled up each every six months journey and and really found so much value that they've continued. That in the is so nice. How does that make you feel to be a part of that change? Oh, I it it's amazing to me. My mom is a Southern girl, was a Southern girl. She's no longer with us, but, uh, and her family is still in the South in, in uh, Greenville, Cal um, South Carolina, which is, you know, a couple hours from here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, she rolled on the back of the bus. She, uh, my grandmother, you know, only worked for white people, ironing and cleaning. And there's so much pain that I have witnessed mm -hmm. just in my family alone. Uh, you know, my dad's side of the family as well. And so for me, I've always wanted to be a part of the change, not just raise sons with my husband and, and let them know how strong they are as young black men. But what else can I do? Yeah. And here I am in conflict resolution. If I can't do this, right? Right? as a part of the work that I do, then, um, yeah, I'm not doing my, what I'm supposed <laughs> to do. And then that voice at 17 that said, right? I have your purpose, yeah, right? That's like me too. I knew that I wanted to be an inspiration in some way because mm -hmm. my story is incarceration. Grew up in the suburbs, nice home, yes. you know, good environment. My mom was, did really good, but I was making dumb decisions, mm -hmm. just doing stupid stuff. And then, but I knew that I wanted to create this type of platform, but mm -hmm. I just didn't know what that platform looked like. So it's crazy how we can have those moments where the voice talks to us and kind of guides us on our journey at a young at a young age. So I, I, I get it. And I'm glad to see you in that space <laughs> and in that purpose. So let's talk about black people and um, how do we. Mm -hmm. Um, not necessarily avoid, but manage the conflict because yeah. I mean, me, my son would tell you how many times I have gone off mm -hmm. on people in the store yeah. and my son who's young, he's a, he's, he's a teenager, mm -hmm. especially during that time, he was probably only 11 or 12. He really doesn't understand racism yet because he hasn't experienced it yet or he has, but he doesn't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Well, me, me and my husband, we, we see it all the time. Yes. And so for me, that's my baby. Right. Don't treat him that way. So what's your advice for 
us as black people to manage that conflict? Yeah, first of all, recognize that any time you engage in a conflict situation, you have to know the effect that it will have on you. So you may go off on someone, but what's the residual for you, right? So if the, the residual is, is high, and it's high for us, right? We're managing so much else. Just a day-to-day dealing with racism affects us emotionally, mentally, physically. So what's what what do I want to say here? Why do I want to say it? How do I want to say it is really important? And do I need to say it? That's the other important yeah. question. Cause but that's a good question to ask because I feel like I always need to say uh-huh. it. <laughs> and so maybe you do, and maybe you need to think about, maybe is do I need to do this? Is like, it really worth yeah, it? Is it worth it? Is it something that uh, is important for me to to do or say and but also but not to run away from conflict that uh, knowing the difference between having really evaluated is this something that I need to talk uh, up on uh, or not or I just don't want to deal, so I'm just going to run. You know, mm-hmm. like, because yeah. most people do and that. And harbor it. Yeah. yeah, and harbor it. Or if it's somebody that you are in relationship with, a coworker, a spouse, whatever, mm-hmm. you let it build up. Mm-hmm. And then what comes out is not your best response, mm-hmm. but rather a probably an ex- explosive reaction, mm-hmm. which then tends to escalate the conflict. Yeah, it can make matters even worse, and it'd be even diff- more difficult. That's right. Yeah, I think that's good, especially knowing to kind of just take a moment to just kind of see and evaluate should this be the time to say something? Because a lot of time, there's two ways. I look at it two ways, just the same way as you, where um, I read a quote that said something about speaking, learn when to stop speaking to someone that that doesn't that's not trying to understand you Mm -hmm. so you know and then but then on the flip side of that this could be a teaching moment as well you know and so um in that situation we were at a you know high-end store getting fitted for tuxedos and it was just like this thing like we wanted the cheap stuff Mm -hmm. you know they send you over to the oh the cell racks in the back You know, and that's offensive, mm-hmm. and you know why. And then she was like, "Oh no, I didn't mean it like that." And maybe she didn't, right. but it's unconscious, don't that's you right. think? Oh, absolutely, a lot of us? absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I talk about that all the time because, unfortunately. Uh, the stereotype that goes along with us is the criminal, mm-hmm. right? Minority, so we don't have money. Right. And we are, that's right. And we don't have money. We come into the store. Uh, for me, I don't spend money where people don't want my money. Yeah, I'm we left real out clear. Of That's right. And so I, so I either tell the person or I don't. I just figure out what I want to do uh, because they don't want my business anyway, right? So why give it to them? But I understand that completely because also you're with your son in a teachable moment. It's like you don't let people treat you like this Mm -hmm. so you either tell the person why you're leaving or you leave and then you tell your child like this is why we left Mm -hmm. this is what happened (laughs) that's good good stuff but it's just trying to balance that that's right now do you teach that like do you teach like how to recognize those flags or those moments or maybe those emotions because for me Mm -hmm. you know I, i was i didn't i don't know how i felt i felt attacked yeah i felt like I was, I just, I, don't know, I felt judged. Mm-hmm. I felt all kind of a different emotion. Mm-hmm. And so it came out the wrong way, but then I got myself together right. and I was able to tell her, you know, I was able to have a conversation with yeah. her and she felt, it seemed genuinely that like she really felt bad about it. Mm-hmm. But are, do you teach people how to? Yes. And I love that. I love that you said that because people think, Oh, well, I done went off, so that's it. Mm -hmm. And I cannot tell you how many times I have said the wrong thing or in the wrong way. And I've stopped Mm -hmm. and pulled myself back, checked myself, did some breathing, and then went back Mm -hmm. to try to repair Right or to say it differently to bring some clarity. That's, that's what I want right. to do, and that and and it can be done. And but you have to want to be able to engage, right? But I do work with people to, because if you check out on your emotions, then you are really never going to be able to center yourself to a place where you can really access good decision making. Because when we when our emotions take over, they tend to rise up. Right? You ever felt heat or anything? 
oh, yeah. in the back of your neck or your head, right? Well, I like people to see the visual of if your emotions are rising up right to the top of your head, then that means that they are over your ears, which means you cannot listen well. The emotion has shut out your ability to listen and that means it has shut out your ability to really access good decision making so you've got to put yourself in a place where you can manage your emotion and I want people to understand because often people will say well you know uh, don't tone police me or don't tell us that we have to uh, be uh, so unemotional. No, that's not what I'm doing. I'm saying, can you access your emotions and put yourself in a place where you can make the best decisions and say the best thing that you can, as you did. Right? Let me give some clarity, right? It didn't mean that you had to be so calm. It meant, okay, it's in a place where I actually can access it to use it to emphasize, right? But it's not going to make me go off on this person. It's going to help me articulate what it is that I want and need to say in this situation. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Internet. All right, you guys, we're going to be right back. No more chains holding me. Hi, family. So I hope you've been enjoying this chain releasing discussion. I tell you, I truly love it when my guests come on here and just pour so deeply into you. So welcome to another episode of Axe RE Q&A. This is when I just simply share my tips and my strategies on how to build your brand equity so that you can become a high income brand. So this week's first question is from Coach Nicole. I'm the owner of a management consulting firm that focuses on creating people-centered workplaces by detoxing toxic work cultures. But I struggle with marketing. Like how do I find my ideal clients or how do I market myself in a way where my ideal clients find me? Oh, Nicole, thank you so much. I love these types of questions. So what this sounds like is that you're interested in positioning your brand, raising your brand equity so that the big guns come to you. And it's so ironic that just a couple of weeks ago, I shared a reel with some really good tips on how to get the big guns to come to you. So let's check that out. Hey family, Ari Squires here. So it's been a minute since I've come on here and done a tip on this Tuesday. So I'm excited to be here to talk about silent money, which is the thing that I love talking about. Silent money, is that offline money, right? It's where the big checks are, right? So in order to do that, it's super important for this to be successful that you get in front of the big guns. That's what I call them, the big guns. Those are the people who make the decisions. Those are the ones that can strike you that check for 50K, can strike you that check for 100K. So in order to do that, you're really gonna have to switch up the way that you're doing your marketing marketing so that the big guns come to you. So let me give you three tips in doing that. One is position your problem and your solution directly to the big guns, not their gatekeepers, okay? The second thing is find out what they're reading and then put articles in what they're reading or find out what podcasts they listen to and be on those podcasts or do ads on those podcasts, okay? They'll come to you. And the last one, which is so important, is join boards or do volunteer service for places and organizations that they serve. It's a great tips, y'all. Hope it's well. So Nicole, I hope that that was helpful for you. Thank you again for your question. So our next question is from Amanda. Ari, so you are an amazing business owner, wife, and mother. How do you find time to balance it all? So you know how I balance my time, you guys, and how I just balance it all because, you know, as entrepreneurs, we are busy, right? We are really, really busy. But what I do is I try not to get too busy. I don't overwhelm myself. But mainly when it comes to my business, I include my my children the best way possible. I include my husband the best way possible. That's number one. That way they're all a part of the process. They understand the process. So that's really big for me. And then my kids are learning along the way, you know, just like this podcast. My son, you see his name scrolling up. You know, he's helping. He's the um, the business manager. He's helping with the bookings. He's helping with the lighting. He's helped like you know what I'm saying? So that helps. So we're spending time and he's learning at the same time. And then also too, I really know how to set boundaries. Setting boundaries is the most important part for me, for women, period, just as us as humans, you know, you got to really set some boundaries with your time. And that includes yourself. Set your own personal boundaries. Like what are you not going to do? What are you going to do? What's important to you? And really, you know, 
putting those things in order for you, like what's most important, you know, in yourself. I believe that I am the most important first or or I can't show up in any other way. So it's really not about balancing. It's about blending. One of my clients had mentioned something about blending. You just blend everything together so that it works well for you. So that's how I handle that. It's a good question. Always a good question. Everybody has different strategies. That's the short form. But thank you, Amanda, for your question. Hey, so if you like some of my brand courses, I have some freebies for you. All you have to do is text me. Just text the word BRAND, all caps, to 202-410-0438, and I'll share with you some free goodies, some courses, some audio, just some good stuff, right, that'll help you along your journey in entrepreneurship. So if you have any burning questions for me about business, about life, about anything, please just shoot me a DM, slide in my DM, and record your questions, and I'll share them on the show. All right, you guys. Guys, let's get back to the show. No more chains holding me. All right, you guys, we are back here. Um, so um, I have a question. Yes. So this whole movement that I've been doing about releasing the chains is about, as you probably heard me discuss in the beginning when I introduced the show, about releasing mental, emotional, financial, and generational chains. So let's think about chains. For you know, chains are sometimes it's ourselves, it's our stories that we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's education we don't have that we haven't sought out or our education that we're not implementing what do you feel when you're working with people in any kind of conflict whether it's just conflict with do you do relational conflict or is it more so on the side okay okay what do you feel is the biggest chain um, that most people have to release in order to begin to manage their conflict better no I think it's historical wounds <laughs> whether you're talking about something big like racism or you're talking about the way your family did conflict when when you were growing up, right? Uh, if the, if you did nothing to try to change it, uh, because most people did not grow up with good models of how to engage in conflict. Most people did not, right? And so it, so those are in, instilled in you, right? And so if you haven't done any work to release those chains, then you're always going to be afraid of conflict. Or if you're not going to be afraid of it, you're always going to blow it up because that was modeled for you as well, right? Uh, and you're never really going Going to seek out the skills and techniques to master it, to be able to engage in a conversation when there's conflict and be able to come out on the other side in a much better place than you were. Mm, so how do we, how will we know that we need your help? Or your assistance. Everybody knows they need my help. They know. Everybody knows know there is no escaping it. So I'm just going to say, you know whether or not you don't do conflict well. So don't even try to get a test or you know, check the box. You know what? For me, I get angry like I know some people not I don't know if it's anger but I get emotional and I want to I don't lash out I'm not like right. a con confrontational person at all like I don't mm -hmm. you know I'm not like cussing folks out right. but I get like I feel disrespected mm -hmm. and so that makes me feel a type of way like uncomfortable yeah. so I start stuttering mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and I'm kind of like just feeling real uncomfortable right. and I'm trying to you know figure out in my mind and my spirit and my heart how to say the right thing but then my voice comes through as like fearful right. you know like I noticed that because I've, I've I mean, we all have conflicts that we do you know That's even right. with my clients I'm just like okay you know how do you handle those yeah. things yeah well first of all I love that you know yourself we got to know ourselves right yes. in conflict like what is it that we do because those are the places where the wounds show up and those are the places where we have to really start to do some work to insert mm -hmm. some skills in there so knowing yourself and having that awareness is really important and then being able to say okay so what are the things that I want to achieve in a conflict conversation yeah. right and so most people most people want it to go away that's not happening yeah. right uh, but but on the other side of it is that they want to resolve it but in between before we get to resolve right because people want to jump straight to resolve mm -hmm. we have to understand mm -hmm. right and we have to uh, we want to be heard as well mm -hmm. right and understood and then we want to work to resolve so the first thing is what are you feeling because you 
say anger, right? Anger sits on top of so many emotions that have not been resolved, mm -hmm. right, or addressed. So anger could be sitting on, on top of hurt and, and betrayal, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It can be sitting on top of, of shame. And there's so many things that we felt before we began to get angry. And so to really peel that away, okay, I'm angry, but what's really underneath that? Yeah, like, get right? into those layers. That's right. And so once we understand what's un underneath it, then we can start to think about, so how do I say what's happening here, right? When you did X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. right? I, I feel betrayed by that, right? Or I, I was disappointed. People don't even, can't even say disappointed. And that's such a very strong one, right? I was really disappointed that you didn't come through in this situation, right? So rather than say that I was disappointed, I, you know, maybe people like to call names. Oh, you're so lazy. You didn't do that. Right? But what, what do you really mean? Like, what is it that they did or didn't do, mm -hmm. right? And what's the feeling that came up for you? That's much better information for someone than to say, you know, Ari, you're just lazy and you, and that's why you did not yeah. do that, right? It's like, mm -hmm. Ari, I was really disappointed when you didn't follow through on this assignment yeah. because I have so much faith in you. Yeah, that's how me and my husband have learned over, over 22 years mm -hmm. <laughs> to communicate is I'm just like, like I'm telling you how I feel mm -hmm. you may not you know feel the same way or That's you right. may not have meant to make me feel I'm just telling you how I feel and you just need to listen and it, it, it's like a miracle right. it has changed the way we communicate so and good. understand each other so that was that's some good advice let's talk about the angry black woman for a minute <laughs> right yes yes <laughs> right let's talk about that stigma mm -hmm. right how does that play out yeah. in let's just say professionals leaders because you work with leaders let's talk yes. about leaders because leaders yeah. can be in the career it can also be in management and entrepreneurship mm -hmm. right even yes. in the church that's right yeah, i mean you leaders in your home true too, you true. know yes true. so ha, angry black woman and that is so personal for me yeah. <laughs> because the honest truth is because of the society that we live in even when we are not angry mm -hmm. even when we are just passionate about something yeah. or simply expressing it in a different way than the person that you're addressing would express it, we get that label. So a lot of, of black women tend to not engage because of that. And what I will say is that you still got to learn the skills and you still have to engage because the folks that are going to see you that way are going to see you that way. It, it absolutely is true. Uh, so I'm not telling you to tone yourself down, but what I am saying is is what is it that you are actually feeling? So you're not angry and, and you can say, listen, I'm not angry. Mm -hmm. I, I just feel very passionately about this or very strongly about this or this is just me, right? Yeah. This is how that's, I express. That's great advice. <laughs> and so to let that person know because if you think that's what they're thinking anyway uh, rather than take yourself out of the conversation be that leader that person who will step up to it but acknowledge probably the dynamics that may be happening uh, and and then speak to whatever it is that you want to speak to and let them know you know no it's not anger that you're you're hearing now let's talk about on the flip side of that yeah. when white people Mm -hmm. Or anyone in a maybe, you know, I don't know much about the Asian culture. I'm, I want to learn more about the mm -hmm. Asian culture, culture. Um, but for them and their perception of most black women being angry, mm -hmm. how do you handle that? Or what's the resolution there to yeah. where, where we're not perceived that way mm -hmm. for on their side of it? Right. You know, like how would they resolve that feeling or yeah you know, I, I mean I think that there's a lot of learning that has to happen when it comes to to racism and and the kinds of stereotypes that are out yeah. there yeah. and so that we have to be talking about it that's why we have summit that's why uh, you know you have to really be able to 
put yourself in the space of learning from people who are talking about these things because we do, we all have stereotypes. We've all grown up on the stereotypes of all these different groups, right? You know, Asians are the model minority. You know, that's a stereotype that, that they have to live with. And we have the angry black woman and the angry black man, right? Mm-hmm. That that stereotype is out there. So just to let folks know, I'm not going to tone myself down for you, mm-hmm. but understand. Maybe I'll say it in a, in a little different way because I don't, in this situation, you know, I'm not trying to scare anybody. So ahead of time, I might say, Lynn, you know, keep your tone together mm-hmm. and just choose the words that are going to best explain what it is. Have somebody... Have somebody that you can sound off to after. I mean, (laughs) we all need that. Because sometimes we can't say it the way we really want to say it because, you know, it might cost us our job or or just even our reputation Mm -hmm. or whatever. So then have somebody that you can vent to, that you can say the things that you know you never want to Yeah, kind of get it off your chest. (laughs) Kind of get off your chest a little bit and you feel better, right? That's right. I totally. <laughs> but I mean, me, I'll let it be known. Like, I I, I try to, the best way, I'm, I'm a communications major. And my mom was a psychologist. Okay. So she really helped us with communication yes. and, you know, kind of, but if we never get it right all the time, I'm not a, I'm definitely not the expert, okay? I listen. <laughs> I am a work in progress. However, I know that I'm, I'm a great listener. Like, I listen, I can, I can feel what you're saying and I'm hearing you i'm making sure that you're finishing your sentence i'm making sure there's a time for me to interject and, and then share that I'm, I'm you know listening and you know we learn this through therapy and all that stuff so these are just great 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 things to have so when's your next summit and can you tell us how we can get in touch with you if we want yes. to or we want to send somebody to you yes <laughs> yes so uh, i love it so i'm at lynnmoreenhurdle.com and that's Lynn with an E and Lynn Maureen Hurdle.com. I'm on Instagram at Conflict Closer. I'm on LinkedIn at Lynn Maureen Hurdle. So those are all the places that you can reach me. I don't know when we'll do another summit. I know if, if we do, it'll be sometime next year. So the best thing to do is to opt in. I have uh, an opt in for folks who want to get information on how to fearlessly, to have fearless conversations around conflict. So just opt in, get on my list. I blog every week. Okay. So once you get on the list, you'll you'll receive my blog. And that always has really good information around resolving conflicts better. That's awesome. Now, yeah. do you go into like the work, people's workforce? I do whatever. It's, yes. Yeah. And so whether it's virtual, whether folks want me to come in and work with their teams, work with their staff, I do that. Mm-hmm. I'll come to conferences and speak. That's good. Yes. That's something. That's a topic that we're not getting a lot you that's know? right especially for entrepreneurs that's because see when you become an entrepreneur right? i've been an entrepreneur for, t- for over 20 years <laughs> so i've dealt with a lot of personalities right <laughs> <laughs> yes. and i love them all because you know i believe that the energy you put out you get back that's so right. my people my customers my clients over the years have been amazing but every once in a while there's conflict you that's know right. there's some there's a situation where someone's not gonna be happy either way and there's those situations but i think that's really great for you to come in and and prepare, yes. you know, entrepreneurs, you know, and leaders with the skills to handle those things because you don't want to lose a great customer or something, or you want to, you know, be able to communicate well right. with your customers and manage that conflict because it's going to happen, right? right. Like it, there's, it, you are not going to be able to escape it. It's going to happen. And you know, one of the things that people think is like, oh, that's optional. I spend my money on trying to get my brand better, trying to get better numbers, trying to, all of that's good. But honey, if you cannot communicate well in conflict situations, yes. you will have less profits. Yes. You know, right? Your brand yes. will have a reputation that you do not want it to have. You got me thinking about somebody <laughs> that I had to work with recently. <laughs> And my husband was like, you handled that pretty good because that person did not know how to take responsibility for their part in what went wrong, you know? And so it was, it, it caused a conflict, but I, I did one of your things and I just let it go. This one was not a battle that was worth even fighting. Right. Right? Right. It was just one of those things, but it does happen a lot. So that's a really, so those of you guys that are looking for a speaker, that's good. If you want to add more value to your events, I think this is really, really, really good. I do too. Yeah. And I think. 
that's why I wanted to add this to the Release of Chains podcast because it's one of those things that we don't talk about yeah. enough. We either want to avoid it, like you said, but we got to have the tools to be able to manage it. So this is really, so really, really good. So what would you say? Just kind of give us a word of empowerment mm -hmm. to anyone listening who have been taking notes, who are writing down your website, following you now on Instagram, getting your freebies. What would you say to them to move forward when it comes to that? Uh, so what I would say is I want you to think about uh, your last conflict right and I want you to recognize that no matter what you do there's always going to be conflict no one's going to escape it so how did how did you do what did it cost you and take the whole full right mental emotional physical uh, your profits like relationship what did it cost you and what would you be willing to do to make sure that you do it better the next time and I hope you'd be willing to to learn some things about it from me uh, bring me in whatever it is that it takes but if you're overlooking this, you're overlooking something that's going to cost you so much more down the line than you'd be willing to have it cost. I love that. So this is part, this particular interview is part of our legacy series. Mm. So what is the legacy that you want to leave in this world? Mm. I, wanted, I want to leave the legacy of people having strong relationships because of the honest conversations that they are having and that uh, the conversations are digging deep enough to get to those wounds that need to be healed. Mm, I love that. I love that. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. Please make sure that you subscribe. You comment below. If you're watching this on YouTube, please comment in the um, comment box under the YouTube channel um, so that more people can see. We Don't you guys, you guys, look, I'm talking to y'all like you're here, right? But don't you guys agree that more people need to be having these types of conversations and all the other conversation that we've been having on this podcast for the last year so please subscribe please like please share and then please follow us on instagram at release the chains or also you can follow me at rv squire speaks i thank you lynn oh, so much pleasure. for coming and sharing and being so authentic and her energy is just amazing so i can see how you can come in and really just bring in that energy that positive vibe and just really help uh, people resolve their conflict so thank you. thank you and i thank you guys for listening we'll see you next time I got